Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of Lyra's Message for the Lesser Shades of Evil RPG. So yeah, this was meant for the guys that will play with me, that will be my players. But of course, if you're just going to watch the stream, this is helpful to understand what's going on. So, third episode. Back to Lyra. Never has a man possessed such passion as my older brother Chorus. Many times did I seek refuge in his arms as a mortal girl, and of all my siblings he was doubtless the wisest. Yet since the horrible death of the first age Corvus had become brooding, by the time we created the hundred his words were few and measured, by the fifteen hundreds he had exiled himself within his dark tower and sought little company. Had our own hearts not been clouded in our minds not warped by our old age, we might have taken earlier notice of the danger that linked that lurked within his thoughts. We surmised he had simply grown tired of life and wished for our duties to end, but wrong we were. Utterly so. Corvus wished for that which was forbidden to all of us and to all of you. To love, to be loved, and to produce progeny. He quested long and far to find the warmth of a loving embrace. Remember the moral legends that speak of the Riddler horseman? These legends are true, for the dark-skinned Riddler was my brother, and he visited many villages. On some occasions, I followed him discreetly as a sparrow and saw him drink spirits and love freely, leaving behind him broken hearts and growing bellies. Still love escaped him for many years. Far and wide he searched for the woman that would appease his ennui. His quest became an obsession, for not a meadow or bar burg did not, he did not visit looking for her. Using three squawking raven forms, Corvus scoured the world, perched on rooftops or flying through cloud he looked for her. It is curious that that of all the women he saw Corvus would settle his ravens around the home of a peasant girl of little fortune and plain features. What made him melt this at her sight I may never know. Her name was Eleanor Bacannon, and she lived in the land of a billion. Corvus watched her from afar using the bodies of cats, ravens, and children. He hinged his way into her life in measured steps, and soon Eleanor was the recipient of the best fortune a mortal child could pr be privy to. Soft meowing at the back and endorsed that letter to discover and adopt a small white cat of surprising intellect. For one, it had the immensely useful capacity of bringing her all manner of precious stones, gold nuggets, and other valuables with which the young Eleanor eased the back and family into financial comfort. As well, the purring feline had a knack for warning her of danger. When thieves broke into the back in the house, the little beast pounced upon their heads and raked them furiously until they fled in haste. A great raven, perched in three branches on her way to basic school, was no less useful. It brought her letters from a man named Armin, a stranger that warned of danger using riddles. When her parents and older brother died tragically, Eleanor became the head of the household and saw to the welfare of her brother and sister. She became a skilled painter and managed to offer her younger siblings a comfortable existence when her paintings gained sudden and unexpe unexpected worth. The back in an orphan seemed its time for greatness, while those that bore them ill intent fell prey to increasingly tragic misfortunes. Announcing himself as their secret correspondent armed, my brother went about seducing Eleanor and won her heart quickly. Together they had three children, Lundi, Ceylon, and Hanak, who themselves begat twelve of their own. For the first time in centuries, Corvus felt like coursing, felt life coursing through his veins, with the laughter of his children and the love of Eleanor. He wished for no other company than theirs. Sinenta remained what my little sparrow saw for more than a hundred years. And so the Bacchanins and their immortal patriarch went through the decades. My brother worked the fields, growing his food as once we all did on the farm of our father. He raised his children and loved his mortal wife. His pleasures multiplied with every spring until the time Eleanor near death. Gifted with forbidden potions and exceers, Eleanor had aged like a fine wine for more than a century and a half, but still she had aged. The bruise of my brother had made it so that at a hundred and fifty years of age, Eleanor looked not a day past fifty. But her body was now far beyond Corvus's crafts. Her last winter was near, and under the light of the moon, Corvus brought her broken body to the Tower of Anicron. As a fly on the wall, I watched my brother lay her down into the immortality machine. Kneeling, he was, his head resting on the great machine as his beloved was spared death. Within his arms she had been carried, and within his hands she would leave, now a golden orb that would age no more. Silently did my brother 
move with his love secure in his right hand, but misery to came to him as he neared the last steps of the great tower. His heresy had been observed by a father, who was found troubled and unthinking. Much in his rash decision, I believe, must have come from the moment's fury, for my, my father is not an evil man. There on the steps did he come upon Corvus and grasp his love from his hands, only to shatter it upon the tower's dark steps. It collided and burst, thus killing her. Corvus fell to his knees, screaming a scream I shall never forget. What a terrible wail! Only my father's blade ended it, as his dagger pierced the heart of my brother's mortal form. Yet the tragedy did not end there. Far away in the land of Abelian, the back end of children and grandchildren would be systematically eliminated by Ori, who slayed them without pity. None were spared his death dealing. Fire burnt in the little one's eyes those days. What rift was then born between Corvus and Ori? Not a word did they exchange from that moment on. Ever. All of you were kept in the dark about the strategy, of course. This was a king's way matter, and one my father was intent on resolving himself. Had I not suited my father as I had always been able to, I have little doubt he would have cast my brother's essence upon the marble floor of his tower. But as it was, my, my word drew the anger from him, as one draws poison from a wound. He understood the troubles of his eldest son, and left with him on a pilgrimage across the world. As night hawks they flew over seas and forests, Ambrose showed his firstborn son a world that stood to be lost were immortals to live among mortals. Over mountains and meadows they flew, visiting peaceful villages where better people lived. Can you risk destroying them so that you may love? Can your desires take precedence over the will of the all seeing? Asked Ambrose of his son, silent and still brooding as they flew. Upon the return, we hoped things could return to normal, and for a while they did. Corvus returned to his tower and seemed convinced of his father's wisdom. How crafty he was to hide his rage from us, from us thus, for my brother boiled with him. His mind became possessed with bitter malice. In the years that followed, many plots were born of my brother's torments. His tower became a fortress of defenses and energies inside of which great machines would come to be. Do not think us fools for being oblivious to his schemings. Troubles came to be in those fateful years that made us look away from one evil that threatened us all. Delphine is consuming madness and Ori's growing fanatism, as well as many mortal concerns, took precedence over Corvus' mysterious planning, for my brother's vengeance took wind as a series of inconspicuous events. In the 1700s, ten folk spoke of ravens that flew over the desert in a queer manner not befitting mundane birds. A series of unexplained comas and deaths would plague some cities and towns. More troubling were words of a dark traveler said to walk the sands with no water, his left hand bearing a ring that shone with an eerie blackness, and in his right a staff bearing a raven upon a cross. His arrival was marked by fierce sandstorms. Corvus was out and about, gathering allies. I've heard stories of the underground ruin of Otimian, a lost first-age city buried under the sands. It is within these ruins that many Angelians awoke in new and odd bodies, terrified. My brother's penetrating words broke their conditioning in short order. Appearing to them as the Dark Stranger, he announced himself as Ravencross, once known as Corvus Kingsway, a man now dead from a family once noble. Excruciatingly methodical, my brother won their hearts and minds one by one over the course of a century. Oh, how patient was he! I gather he crafted the doom of our family for the better part of two hundred years before striking. Thus were Shard of Shade, Dream and Red Lotus, the most ancient immortals from the land of fire, the first to be counted among his followers. With their help, they attacked younger Angelians whose hearts they could poison easily, such as the twins Rain and Sun. He warmed his way into the hearts and taught them to discover an age they knew very little about. Deep in the ruins of Italian was a great library of books, among other equally potent artifacts. In an old amphitheater, and my brother spoke of the first age to his followers in a way that more that none had heard before. They learned of its many cultures, its religions, and philosophies, and scientific breakthroughs, its great thinkers, its wars, and its achievements. Ravencross told them of the king's ways, and of our murderous achievements. He told them about the forbidden technology, the trickeries we had used to bring an entire people to their knees before a counterfeit god. He read them at their passages from books and poems more than 4,000 years old, their minds blossoming and their eyes wide. At night they lusted after one another like animals using unfiltered and fully functional human bodies to caress and love each other's flesh. When he saw their hearts were his, Karen Cross prepared them for the war that would need to be waged. His father would soon wish for Angeline kind to leave the world of mortals. If they did not act quickly, they would be lost. 
Raven Cross taught them how to control many forms and those of animals as well, with which they became the eyes and ears of the master, spying on his skin. They were taught the ways to battle their immortal brethren and were given artifacts of terrible power. They studied the defenses of the five towers and planned incessantly. They called themselves the followers of Ravencross, and by 1901, they were ready for war. We will go straight into the next chapter, because this one was quick. Prior to the start of the war, the world was divided into six great realms, five each under the rule of a king's wife, child, or who presided over the north, northern Birdland, his white tower floating above his clouds, Delphine at the under uh, Aegis, the eastern parts of the land of Abelian, a tower of white and silver built in its frigid northern steps. Erden's stone tower pierced western Abelian sky from the summit of a small mountain. My own tower of emerald and bronze was solidly anchored to Emerald Mountain's peak in the southern Birdland, its great walls hidden from mortal eyes by potent artifacts in the mountain's mists. Corvus had chosen the land of fire as the foundation for his dark tower. The sixth was that of the Forbidden Land, ruled by my parents from the mighty Tower of Anicron, in whose lowest levels the Immortal the Machine, the Vault of Essences, and the Nine Obelisks of Knowledge were to be found. What matters to the war is that the thousands and some Angelines that had been essence since the 500s had their essences kept in vaults buried deep inside each tower. Hence, even before the start of a war. Corvus possessed the essences of more than a hundred inch lines, most of which were now to be counted among his followers. His biolab secretly produced many lethal organic forms, and his minions were well versed in the ways of controlling these ghastly beasts. Under his black towers skirmed and twitched, crawled and eaved countless monstrosities, many attuned to the essence of his followers. This great war of the Second Age began on Gold Wall 22nd, 1901. Villagers from the southern coastal villages heard terrible bellows of the off to the north as an eerie trembling of the earth rattled the windows of their homes. Children pointed to a great shadow rising to the sky, an ominous sighting of the ve of Venom Head, my brother's horrific war barge, as it proceeded forth into the clouds, and its wake followed hundreds of nameless beasts bailing to the sun. Seamen watched in horror as their vessels heaved, the oceans steering fiercely as great worms lurched under the waves. All over the world, minions of Ravencross shed their disguises and reeked of Auckland cities, setting fires and destroying without restraint as a diversion to the main force. Angel lions stood in awe trying to quell the mayhem, only to fall to the blades of their treacherous brethren. Beasts oozed into towns and villages as mortals took shelter in their homes. Far away in the depths of the Forbidden Land, wait within sight of the Tower of Anicron and the abode of my beloved parents, awoke the first of the, Div of the Vidian destroyers, bursting forth through the heart to the earth. On its shores fell worms ambled towards the great tower from the sea. The war had thus begun. Promptly did father and mother try to summon their tower's mighty defenses, but in vain, for precisely crafted was the treachery of my brother. From within he added sabotage the generators, leaving it without its most potent barriers as the looming shadow of venom had pierced the clouds above it, following by a horde of violent, terrible creatures. As it descended, it casts a torrent of green flame upon the tower, rendering the land about it incandescent and slaying many of its creatures in an instant. The tower stood, however, and unleashed energies of its own against the failing most falling monster. Energy, glo blah, sorry. Energy globes and incineration beams crisscrossed the skies as the two behemoths battled. The sky burned, turning red, orange, purple, and black as the very fabric of reality crackled and sizzled with murderous rage. Venom head sides were holed and bleeding orange flame as it fell uncontrollably, while from its belly flew forth thousands of fell warriors and other monstrosities who took assault to the few unprepared angelines training at the tower's base. I reached the scene to witness a horrible monster climbing slowly up the tower sides, its segmented body coiled about, its, about it grotesquely. This was a Vidian destroyer, among the most terrifying, terrifying of my brother's creations. Some fifteen to twenty stories above his ghastly be beast, my father stood on the tower's highest balcony, a bright lens of white energy jumping forth from his power ring and reaching it deep into Venom Head's belly, disemboweling the great vessel and sending it crashing many miles away to the sound of a thundering explosion. What a vision of madness! Thick, eerie smoke could I see emanating from the Tower of Anicron its upper levels incandescent from the enemy's attacks. 
Locked in its highest room, Ambrose and his firstborn battled with swords and unleashed powers at one another that shook the walls of the tower. They battled for many hours, hacking through and vaporizing over a dozen of each other's mortal forms while much below them at the foot of the tower, followers of Ravencross approached its gates. There they met Elizabeth, and five thousands died. Five thousand died before my mother's last body fell, consumed in a cloud of bluish flame. The gates were finally breached. His last body pierced and broken by his son's blows, Ambrose triggered the remaining defenses of the tower moments before he was decapitated. The tower of Anicron boomed under a powerful explosion deep in his belly. The immortality machine, the nine obelisks of knowledge, and the vault of essences were consumed by flame. As the essences were incinerated across the world, the mortal forms of the most ancient angelians fell dormant and will never awake again. Corvus and his minions were now in control of the Tower of Anicron, a black monument to the war, surrounded by a field of burned and poisoned land as far as the eye could see. Yet the war was not limited to the Forbidden Land. While his main force attacked the Tower of Anicron, several other hordes of his minions took salt to the four towers of his siblings, including my own. Ori's floating tower, victim to some evil trickery, fell like a stone from the sky without so much as fire or smoke draining it. It crashed with deafening thunder within the forest of Ashergillion, levying trees and villages for more than a thousand square miles around it. Followers of Ravencross Chorus cowered its smoldering ruins soon after, doubtless to trying to retrieve Ori's essence. I know not of their success or failure, but my suspicions are that my little brother's essence must have shattered when his tower crashed. Nothing could have survived it. Eridan's stone tower f fared somewhat better. Besieged by great waves of poisonous animals and men possessed of eerie powers, the tower's defenses led to 700 deaths among the mimics and beasts of Corvus. Eridan fought furiously and prof profited from a lull in the bloodshed to carry away the essences of the Angelians from his vault using the body of a giant eagle moments before his tower fell. Pursued by many foes, Eridan managed to land his eagle form upon my unbattled tower and give its precious load of essences to two of my most trusted servants, Butter Sky and Dark Blue. His eagle was then slain in battle against more than a dozen beasts of Ravencross, and Eridan was never heard from or seen thereafter. Yet he too had been crafty in some manners, for while his tower was attacked, he had assaulted the Dark Tower of Corvus off into the Land of Fire. Caught by surprise, Corvus awakened some of his forms and defended his tower fiercely, the two brothers battling bitterly for many, many hours and dispatching many of each other's forms. His remaining bodies, few and his defeat inevitable, for Corvus used his giant raven to escape with the essences of his most trusted followers while setting fire to the rest. Using one god, the power ring I had crafted for him, Eridan lifted the dark tower into the sky and cast it into the warm waters of the desert ocean where it now rests broken to this day. Delphina, my mad sister, in her tower of white and silver, battled the forces of his older brother fiercely. Corvus had foolishly underestimated her knowledge of biologies. As she broke one of her fiendish demon eggs, the lens about her tower became pestilent and oozing, trapping the fell warrior army and leading to their deaths, all three thousand strong. Though eventually my brother did manage to breach her gate, she stayed his advance with calamity. A plagued pearl of such murderous potential, even Corvus' rage was quelled upon seeing it. In exchange for most of the essences of her vault, Corvus agreed to let her be. To this day she remains within her tower, breeding organisms of vile or entrailing forms. Mortals and immortals alike now speaking of the woman of a thousand faces. The war did destroy many of her tower's defenses, however, so that the artifacts she used to camouflage it are no more. Mortals and angelines can now see the dread tower and be both lured and disgusted by it. I am proud to say that as I speak to you now, my, nine years after the fall of Venomhead upon the tower of Anicron, my tower's defenses are just now yielding to my brother's attacks. Much torment did I inflict upon him during these nine years, together with some of my most loyal angelines. We withstood endless onslaught by monsters able to incinerate or wither away life by simple touch. We cured in monstrosities of our own, unleashing them against our foes in the Tower of Anicron. I used my own library to craft potent artifacts of a kind meant for battle and devised the bane baneful blacknesses less than one year ago. A pity I had no more of these. Yet my tower today falling, and with it the war is at an end. My brother is victor and I am in exile. Corvus controls the Tower of Anicron, the senses of my mother and father, and those of other over 200 Angelines. Let me tell you that the war has not ended in total victory for Corvus, that, and that there is still hope. True, the essences of Ambrose and Elizabeth are his. 
Ori is likely dead. Delphine has been relieved of most of her power. Aerodin is in exile and myself soon to be. Corvus does control the Tower of Anicon and possesses over 200 essences. However, the Immortality Machine, the Golem Hordes and the Nine Obelisk of Knowledge tend destroyed. He can neither create more Angelions nor craft powerful artifacts with which to destroy you. Of the 1,000 and some Angelions born of the Second Age, 500 have perished that will never again wake, for their essences were destroyed. This leaves slightly over 500 Angelions alive in the world, over 300 remain free of Corvus, so that three of you exist for every two of his minions. But time is not on our side, for my brother's plans are already unveiling. I have spied upon his activities for the last decade. It seems that the terraformatrons hidden within the Tower of Anicron survived the war, for I have seen them move once more. They are mighty machines, the very ones we used to cleanse the worlds and engineers its rebirth, and now half a dozen are under the power of Corvus, more being awakened every few years. Already as gifted as the most valuable, f uh, valued followers with kingdoms terraformed by these machines, within which they may one day rule as gods. I have seen at least one island rise to the sky under their power, and I suspect the regions surrounding the Forbidden Land will be substantially fortified and transformed to my brother's wishes, so as to prevent attacks. But Corvus knows one artifact above all others may quicken his dominions of the world. Remember that eight years ago, amidst the chaos and confusion of the war, you heard of the flight of a giant raven whose wings could have provided shelter to thirty men. You heard of the golden cage held within its talons, within which was imprisoned a small boy having but one leg. Few of or those that have actually seen it, for whatever this great raven crippled or visited was burned to ashes or plagued by disease and plague and death. Know that the boy was the body of my father, a crippled form engineered by Corvus to torment him as he flew over towns and cities within his terrible raven, destroying at will. As much for revenge against Ambrose for the slaying of Eleanor, as surmised Corvus' intent on tormenting my father until he reveals the, process the processes necessary for the construction of a second immortality machine. Were this to happen, were my father to teach him the ways, then all will be us. Corvus could then give birth to an immortal army that will scour the world in search of your essences and lead to your deaths or enslavement. As I speak, Corvus has now imprisoned my father in a trap box named Torn Rose, an artificial reality where his spirit is tortured and flayed horribly. Our fate may break him and lead to my brother's total victory. As for my mother Elizabeth, I have had no contact with her since the war. I doubt even Corvus will willness. Sorry, I doubt even Corvus's willingness to hurt her, for all of us, including him, loved her dearly. She may be out and about, trapped or otherwise incapable of reaching me. Aridan has disappeared as well, and may be dead, for his essence was not of those he trusted me with. Do not seek Delphine's aid or company. She is lost, and those whom she lures to her tower are doomed to join her in madness. Thus I have spoken to you when I wish to speak. I know my words may seem blasphemous, but know that they are true to the very last. I have grown weary of lies, and wish for my king's will legacy to be composed of other things than deception. Do not hate Ambrose King's wife, for his vision was great and his objective nothing less than holy. He wished to create a peaceful mankind and the tools he chose bore names such as have a myth, the holy word, and the all-seeing. And in the thing's actions to have been guided by higher force, they were his own, as were ours, yours, and every mortal's born since the beginning of time itself. We are simply guided by our beliefs. Before you brand the king's way our monsters, remember the golden thousand, the ten centuries of peace mortals enjoyed under until my brother's treachery. Let it be said that never before in the history of the world has such a wake, a warless period existed. Was it not for Corvus treachery, I believe the world could have enjoyed many more thousand golden thousands. Were not our lies necessary evils when one sees the immense good that was born of them? Now I must see to your safety. A thousand of my white hawks will take flight, each carrying a golden orb in its talons away from my tower, and the minions of Corvus who are laying siege to it. Seven hundred will carry decoys, while three hundred will each carry an essence. I doubt my brother's minions will be able to intercept more than take token numbers so that most of you will survive free. A hawk will find your mortal form and hand you your essence, which you must hide promptly and well. Never must my brother or his followers find it, or you will shall become one of his minions. Keep it safe at all costs. Within minutes, those of you met within the Tauten but Birthland will see a second sun atop Emerald Mountain. It shall signal the fall of my tower. I shall destroy the pipe organ with which I speak to you, now before my brother discovers its keys, and hopefully I lay waste to as many things from the Tower of Anicon as I can before I am found. Dormant bodies attuned to my essence remain scattered across the wall, so fear not. I shall live through this.
do not despair and know that for whatever belief you upheld the princip the principles of my father sorry there's a typo do not despair and know that for whatever belief you upheld the principles of my father your action served to better an entire world and its people both of whom stand to be lost should you abandon the fight those of you that doubt my words or suffer too much by the death of your beliefs may cast your assassins upon the rock and be rid of suffering these of you that wish to fight on for the lives of mortals i bid you farewell and perhaps we may once day one day rejoin forces and need the world from under the shadow of my brother farewell and that is it a few hours after the end of the message which ends abruptly a white arc reaches your current mortal form ending you a golden orb obviously you decided not to throw it upon a rock as you will be a playable character in the in the campaign I'll see you there if you have any questions or any comment leave it in the comments and I will respond promptly thank you bye bye guys